Last time we were talking about vectors and the dot product. And so today we're going to talk about vectors and the cross product. Again, there are lots of other kinds of ways of putting vectors together, but not ways that we need. These are the only two um, that, that matter for us. And as far as the cross product that we're going to talk about now, this is only for, again, three-dimensional vectors. So everything that we're talking about today is dealing strictly with three-dimensional vectors. All right, so remember that given two vectors, the dot product, one of the algebraic descriptions, or excuse me, one of the geometric descriptions, was that the dot product of A and B was the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, the cross product, geometrically, is defined, again, to be the length of A times the length of B, <coughs> excuse me, times the sine of the angle between them. But then, since this is a vector, or the, we'll, we'll think of it as a vector. Technically, there's some, there's some slight variations in terms of a vector versus a pseudo vector, but we're not going to get into that. There's this length times a unit vector n. All right, now the question is, remember this, this notation means that, that n is a unit vector, and a unit vector has what? Length of 1. OK, so what do we need if we have this unit vector? We know its length is 1. What else do you need in order to have a vector, in order to be able to describe a vector? Direction. A direction. All right, so what is the direction of n? And this is going to depend on whether we are talking about a right-handed coordinate system or a left-handed coordinate system. All right, so if we have, say, vector A that's pointing off. Again, this is, this is a three-dimensional vector, but remember, we can rotate things around to draw three dimensions in, uh, in a plane. And let's say we have vector A like that and vector B like this. And then just whatever directions they were pointing, but we've rotated around and we're looking at, at vector A and vector B. To figure out the direction of the unit vector, we do the handedness things that we have done before. What do we do? If it's a left-handed coordinate system that we're thinking of, we point our thumb in the direction of the first vector, of vector A, first finger in the direction of vector B, and then the middle finger points in the direction of the unit vector. So the cross product in this particular case of a left-handed system would point out toward us. Because it's the first vector, the second vector, and then that direction. Now, it's hard to do, for instance, if A and B are almost pointing opposite, right? can't really stretch your fingers far enough apart, but you just kind of roughly right? get, get this one correct and then get the other vector as close as you can. Now, what if this were a right-handed system? If this were a right-handed system, which way would A cross B point? Well, A, then B, and the cross product would point away from us. All right, so it's the same situation that we had before with the left-handed versus right-handed coordinate systems. But the direction of this vector is determined by which system we're using. And so, again, it, we, we, we don't need to worry about um, the, some, some more technical details of it. Um, but this geometric definition um, looks similar to the dot products geometric description, or one of the geometric descriptions of the dot product, but sine rather than cosine, and then there is a direction associated as well. All right? Um, so let's think about what can happen. Again, we're looking at the angle between these vectors uh, in this way. What would happen if we swapped 
this. If we looked at B cross A instead, so remember A cross B on the left-handed system looks like this. So the cross product is pointing out toward us. On a right-handed system, it's the other way around. What happens with a left-handed system with B cross A? Yeah, then we do B and A, and N points the opposite direction. Its length is still the same, but it points in the opposite direction. So what happens when you change A cross B and you look at it in reverse order? You get not the same answer. You get the opposite, right? The direction changes. Does that happen for the, for the dot product? What happens for the dot product? We saw last time that it's the same, right? It doesn't matter which order you do this, because what happens? All that changes are these two numbers trade places. And multiplying numbers, it doesn't matter. So for the dot product, this is what's called commutative. You can change the order. They commute. This is what's called anti-commutative. If you change the order, you also have to change the sign because the direction of the corresponding vector changes. All right, so we just have to remember that, right? Just keep track of what's going on and everything um, is, is okay. Now, again, this is a geometric explanation of what's going on. And it doesn't tell us directly how to calculate to know for sure what direction n is going. We're using our hands, but how do we do that if we are doing calculations with something, right? So we also will have an algebraic way to calculate this, that the algebra will determine the, um, the correct direction for us. Um, all right, so what's going on? This. We, we might ask why we define it in this way. Uh, and again, there's, it's not just, oh, somebody arbitrarily deciding, let's do it like this. There's meaning, there's usefulness uh, of having this particular, this particular description. But before we get into that, let's look at what would happen if we had unit vectors in each of the three cardinal directions, right? So what vector are we talking about here? For the x direction, a unit vector in that direction would look like this. A unit vector in the y direction, like this. Now, typically, when we are doing these calculations, we will write these as column vectors because it, there's a, kind of a mnemonic device that goes along with it. Um, so we will, to be able to remember what happens. So in a minute, I'm going to start writing all these vectors vertically rather than, than as row vectors. Um, when we write the, the method uh, in our vector class, then it won't matter at all at that point. Uh, but just so we can can keep track of some things a little bit easier to kind of not necessarily memorize the formula, but just make it easier for us to recreate when we need it. Um, all right, so what would happen again if we think of if we think of a left-handed system, if we had x positive x in that direction and positive y in that direction. On a left-handed system, which direction does the third axis point? Yeah, inward, away from us, right? So we, we said we would draw that like that. Right, so, so on a left-handed system, x, y, and then the third axis is pointing away from us. And we've talked about why that would be beneficial in terms of like a gaming thing, because you're moving forward, going into the screen. Um, 
there's other ways, again, that we could have this. If we're looking at right-handed, it's going to be, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. But in the left-handed system, what do we have? We have a vector, a unit vector pointing that direction, a unit vector pointing up, and a unit vector pointing into the board away from us. So what would happen if we did the x cross y unit vectors? What do we get? Well, that's what we just, just did, right? The x, the y, that's the first, the second, and then the third one is pointing in that direction. Is that okay? What would happen if we did this? We shouldn't have done that one yet. I should have gone in a different order. Uh, let, let's hold off on that one for just a second. I want, to, I want to do this in a particular order to make things happen the way we want. What would happen if we did y and z? So the first one's pointing up. The second one is pointing, a first finger pointing into the board. And which direction is our middle finger point? Right. To the right, which is which is the X, right? All right. So what happens? So it was X in the next one, Y in the next one, and now let's wrap around, right? So what happens if we do this? First finger, or thumb, excuse me, pointing into the board. First finger pointing to the right. And what happens with the, with the middle finger? It's pointing up. So we get that. We OK? So if you do these in these orders, what do you get? You just get the other coordinate system, the other coordinate axis, excuse me. So let's look at what happens if you turn this around. What happens if we point the thumb up first and then the first finger in the x direction? Negative there. What happens if first finger or th a thumb up, first finger? Let's see, we're switching this around, so wait a minute. Um, we're looking at this direction. So thumb into the board. First finger f uh, pointing up. What happens to the middle finger? It's going to the left, so negative x. And the last one, thumb, first finger pointing into the board, and the other is pointing in the opposite direction, pointing down. All right, so what happens? It does flip the signs accordingly. You change the order, you get the opposite direction for the other for the other piece. What if we did this all right-handed? Right-handed, x. So what would happen on the right-handed system? On a right-handed system, which direction does the points out? I don't know if we can rotate that around or not. No, I guess not. On a right-handed system, this points outward. And so what happens? Thumb in the x direction, first finger in the y direction. And this is still true. What about this one? Thumb 
in the y direction. This finger in the z direction. And where's the x? Same position. What about here? Uh, here we go, turn it around here. Thumb, first finger, middle finger. What happens? This is the, exactly the same whether we're talking about right-handed or left-handed. Right? So we don't have to change this part. It's just what are we visualizing? Which direction are these things pointing changes? But the calculations don't change any at all. Make sense? But what do we have to do? We do have to determine uh, are we talking about right-handed or left-handed so that we make sure things are actually going in the direction that we, that we intended uh, when, if, we're, um, if we're thinking about it or doing, doing work with this. All right. Now, again, in pi game, what do we have? Pi game, we only have two dimensions, so we don't actually have a, a handedness because there is no... There is no z component, right? But what happens in other situations? In other situations, we do need to know, um, just so we can be sure that everything is, is exactly what we're intending, uh, we do need to keep track of, of the handedness of things so, so that we can recognize the, the correct direction. All right, so what happens? This is a little bit different than other things that we're used to. We've never seen something else where changing the order changes direction. Have we ever seen things where changing the order of something doesn't give you the same answer? What if you put on your shoes than your socks? Does that give you a different result than if you put on your socks than your shoes? Yeah, it does, right? Is it exactly the opposite result? Well, I don't know if it's opposite result, but it's a different result. So there are lots of things you have to do in order to get what you wanted to have happen. The nice thing about this is if you do it in the wrong order, I guess the worst thing you've done is, is gone in the wrong direction. Um, that can matter a lot, right? If your character walks off the cliff instead of walking away from the cliff. Um, a couple of years, last year, I guess, uh, we had a... Uh, a programming competition that involved a tank battle. So we created, uh, each character had a tank and they created the, a, a strategy to attack other tanks on this, on this board. We're going to uh, explore a version of that a little bit later this term. And um, some of the groups used the They, they flipped the angles uh, in pi game because the pi game with the x and the y positive, like a 90 degree angle, could be interpreted differently. And there was some confusion about which direction was 90 degrees. And so they would track the, the enemy, uh, the other tanks, and then fire in exactly the wrong direction. And so you would get tanks that were going and hiding uh, against the side of the, of the wall, going up and down the side, and supposed to be firing across the board at the other tanks, and instead be firing into the wall on the side. Um, and so the issue was everything was exactly flipped from the direction that they intended. And so... Uh, so we don't know how well their, their uh, tanks were actually designed because you know, they may have done much, much better if they weren't firing into, um, into the wall. Some of the tanks would go hide in the corner, and then s the, the, the intent was to like, hide in the corner and just fire across the whole board like this, but instead they were firing into the wall the whole time. So hiding in the corner, which was a good thing, but then they were just firing into the wall. Um, and so... Direction can really matter. In this particular case, we're talking about a three-dimensional thing. It's a different reason, uh, and, and soon we'll look at a lab, uh, again, that lo looks at what was going on there, uh, and we'll get it so that we can fire in the correct direction. Uh, we'll, we'll, but we'll talk about what happened uh, in more detail at that point, though. All right, so does this sort of make sense, that 
We have this thing designed or defined uh, in some way, and we have a, a way to work with it. Now, what does it mean? If we look at this cross product, why would someone have, have designed it or defined it in that particular way? So let's see, if we have a vector A and a vector B, again, these are three-dimensional vectors, but we've put them together with the, the tails together, and we're looking at them so that they're in this plane, right? whatever plane this happens to be. We can create, it's supposed to be parallel, we can create a parallelogram where you have another copy of A over there and another copy of B up there, or really we have this parallelogram where the sides are parallel to A and the other sides are parallel to B. The lengths uh, correspond to the lengths of A and the lengths of B. So I have a parallelogram. This parallelogram is living in some three-dimensional place, but it's just a just a parallelogram, so we're looking at it uh, in, in the flat sense. How long is this side? It's however long A was, right? How long is this side? However long B was. And if we knew A and B, we could calculate that, right? So these are numbers that we could have. And right here, there's an angle that's the angle between those two vectors. How would we calculate the area of a parallelogram? Do you remember how to calculate the area of a parallelogram? Yeah. What do you need to calculate the area of a parallelogram? You need that height right there. What do we do with that height? The area of the parallelogram is the length of that base times that height. Why is that? What happens? What happens if we cut off this triangle and move it over there? Then it's a rectangle. Right? If you cut off this triangle and just move it over here, then it's a rectangle. And what's the area of a rectangle? Base times height, right? Length times width or something, but the, the base times the height of, of the rectangle. So the area of this parallelogram is the base times the height. And so we need to figure out what that height is. So what do we have? We have a triangle right here. There's an angle. There's a height. Do we know how long this side is? No. Do we know how long this side is? Yeah, that's the length of A. What do we know about anything else about this triangle? Anything? There's a 90 degree angle right there, right? That's a right angle. All right, so what do we have? We know something about the sine of the angle. What's the sine of the angle? It's the opposite over the hypotenuse. So h over the length of a. So let's solve for h. H is the length of A times the sine of theta. So what is the area of this parallelogram? It's this times that. And these are all just numbers, right? B is a number, and these are numbers. So what could we do? Length of A times length of B times the sine of theta. Have we ever seen that anywhere? Just a few minutes ago, right? What is this? The area of this parallelogram is the length of that vector. 
right? Because this is a number and that has length one, so that number times that gives this vector that particular length. So what is this? A is the length of A cross B. What about B cross A? Well, the length is the same, right? So we don't have to worry about the, the order of the calculation there. It's also the length of B cross A. Um, but so because once you have the length, the length is ignoring the direction, right? So we don't have to worry about that. It's, it's this cross product gives us the area of that parallelogram. So what does that mean? It means we don't have to go through all these calculations trying to figure out what the angle is or anything like that. It's all built into the calculation. Of course, we don't know how to calculate this yet, right? We don't have an algebraic way to get the number. We still are like we were with the dot product. We have this geometric interpretation, this geometric meaning, but we don't have um, a way to calculate it just yet. But does it make sense? Do you see that that is exactly the area of this parallelogram? And then this is built into the definition of, of the cross product. All right, so how do we do this algebraically? How do we actually calculate something? So algebraically, now this is where I'm going to write these in column form. So if I have a vector v and w, 3D vectors, and we're going to think of this as having an x, a y, and a z component, and then w is the same way. All right, now let's look at V cross W. For V cross W, again, it's going to have the three components. Let's make a little more space there. That might. All right, so for the X component, we ignore the x in v and w, and we look at the other two components. And what we do is we create an x. We look at the vy times this, so we go this direction, and then we subtract the multiplying in the other direction. So we do add this and subtract this, except I've written it add this and subtract in that way. But it doesn't matter, right? The, the order you do, but it's these two are multiplied together, and then you subtract what happens when you multiply these two together. Now, why are we defining it in this way? Well, it turns out this is the thing that matches the geometry. All right? So that is the x portion. It involves only the y and the z. All right, now let's take a look at the next component. What do you think is going to happen in the next component? You're not going to use the y's. You will use the other two. Okay, but the idea of this is it rolls, it kind of wraps around in the same way that we did um, with your fingers, right? What's, what's wrapping, you know, this finger goes to that, goes to that. And so what do we do? We think of this like that. This is now the top line and that is the bottom line. 
And so what do we get in this case? Still the same. Add these and subtract that direction. Sometimes you see it written in a different way. We'll, we'll say that in just a second. Uh, then the third component, what do, you, what do we do? Leave it out of the calculation, and it's the other two. All right? And it turns out that this approach gives exactly the answer um, that corresponds to what we, what we wanted it to be geometrically. All right, let's take a look. Sometimes uh, this is written in a slightly different way, so I'm going to, to do this. The first line is the same. We do ignore the x part. Second line, ignoring the y part, if we did that with this, what was here, if we did vx, wz minus vz, wx, how does that compare to this? Look at what's happening here. What's happening here? This part is being added on, and over here it's subtracted. Over here, this part's being subtracted, and that part's being added. If we don't kind of imagine rewriting that with this line at the top and this line below it, we have to make that value negative. So sometimes you'll see it written like this instead of like that. Uh, but then this line stays exactly the same. All right, so what's going on here? is this is the easier way to, to, to write the code, right? This is the easier way to implement. Um, they're the same calculation, just keeping track of exactly what's going on. This vector has this property automatically built into it. Now, what do we need to do? We probably need to, to check that and compare it to some actual vectors so that you can, can believe that, so that it's not just magic hand-waving. Um, but what do we have? We have this geometric interpretation, and we have an algebraic way to actually calculate the pieces. All right, so let's, uh, let's check this with some, with, with some things that we already know the answer to. We know the answer of what we expect to get in some of these cases, like that case. What happens if we do x cross y? What do we expect to get? All right, x cross y, we expect to get z. So let's try it by this definition and see what happens. x cross y. 1, 0, 0, cross 0, 1, 0. What happens? The x component says we do this minus this. So we have 0 minus 0. The next component says we do what? I'm going to use the part that I just erased, just so we can keep track of it. It's 0 minus 0, but the opposite of that. Right? This minus this, and then the opposite, but it's still 0. And then what about the last value? It's this, 1, minus 0, which is 1. And what do we get? We get exactly... what we thought we should get, right? the correct 
cross product. And this works no matter which vectors we put into place. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about, again, right-handed or left-handed, the corresponding pieces work out. Make sense? All right, so if we wanted to find the area of a parallelogram, we could calculate this vector and then find its length. So we don't have to worry about calculating the angles at all. We don't have to worry about finding the height. All of that takes care of itself as part of the calculation. All right. Um, now, what happens, though, if we drew that parallelogram actually on the board? So let's say here's the origin. And let's say this is the point 3, 0. And up here is the point, uh, let's say this is 1, 1. So what's that point right there? 4, 1. So let's say we drew that parallelogram right there. And we said, OK, we want to find the area of that parallelogram. That's not a three-dimensional thing, is it? So we can't do cross products. How could we make this work for us? Yeah, we could just say, well, this vector is 0 in that direction, right? It's 1 in the x direction, 1 in the y direction, and just 0 in the away from the board or into the board direction. B looks like that. And so we turn the two-dimensional problem into a three-dimensional problem. And then what happens? The area of the parallelogram would be the length of that vector. And so we do this calculation and then find the length of that. So let's do that. Let's do this calculation and then find the length of So what do we get here? So 0 minus 0, so that is 0. The y value is 0 again. Right? Don't forget, if you're calculating it without re rewriting, you have the negative sign in front, but it's still 0 minus 0, so it's just 0. And the third value? Zero minus three, so the cross product is zero, zero, negative three. So what is the length of that vector? How long is the vector zero, zero, negative three? It's three. All right, so this says that the area of this thing should be 3. Is it? Yeah. Well, what's the height? Is 1. What's the base? 3. 3 times 1 is 3. Now, this time it was a lot easier, right? We could have done that without doing all this work. But what if the numbers hadn't been nice, right? These numbers were nice, so it all uh, works out just fine. Um, and often, what do you know? Often, what you know are the lengths themselves and not what the coordinates are. Um, and so um, th that's you know, a, an extra step to it. But what happens? This parallelogram does have area equal to 3. And the calculation gives us that value.
So what's the purpose of even making the kettle hole? Well, so this is this is just an, a connection that if you this is a way that the cross product can can be used if you needed to calculate an area of something. There's a lot of other ways we're going to use the parallelogram or use the cross product as well that doesn't that, that doesn't have anything to do with the parallelogram. I was just showing that the calculation that we did back here really does work if we use this algebraic definition. Right? So um, and so in general, for our purposes, we're not creating parallelograms and calculating their areas. It's just w that this connection is there. So there are things that we are going to do that involve cross products, uh, that involve distances between things, even volumes of things. There are, there are times when, um, um, for our purposes, we might need to calculate volumes, and we'll be able to do that using the cross product as well. But, but the cross product is going to show up in a lot of different ways. Um, I was wanting to emphasize that it does give us the answer that we expected in, in the algebraic versus the geometric description. Geometrically, okay, we did a little bit of maths here and said, yes, geometrically, this is the length of that thing. Algebraically, we made up something that seems like it came out of nowhere, but it does match what it should, what it should be. All right, so what happens uh, with the dot product? And the cross product, they both tell us some information uh, about, about the vectors, even if we don't calculate them completely. So what did we know, for instance, if the dot product was 0? What did that mean? If the dot product was 0, what did that mean about the vectors? Do you remember? What if the dot product was positive? What did that mean? Well, it just meant the two vectors were pointing in the same direction. They could have been both pointing to the left, but they were pointing in roughly the same direction. Right? Negative means they're pointing in roughly the opposite direction. Zero meant the two vectors were perpendicular, right? So this means A is perpendicular to B. All right? What would happen if the cross product, well, it's not zero in this case, what, what do we get if the cross product, it's a vector, so if the cross product is the zero vector, what does that mean? Think about this. A cross B is the length of A times the length of B times the sine of the angle between them times some unit vector. It's pointing in the correct direction. So what happens if this is the zero vector? If this is the zero vector, it means that all of this has to be zero. So how can we make this be zero? Well, one way to make this part be zero is to make that be zero. Well, what if the length of a vector is zero? Then you have the zero vector, right? So it means that A is the zero vector, or we can do the same thing with B. B is the zero vector, or what else could happen? Sine of the angle is zero. Well, when would the sine of theta be zero. What does that mean? It means the angle is zero degrees. Alright, so this means that the angle is zero, zero degrees or zero radians, or what? Mm. 180 degrees, or pi radians, right? And so what would that mean? If A cross B gives us the zero vector, either one of those two vectors was the zero vector, or the two vectors, the angle is zero, which means they point in the same direction, or the angle is 
pi, which means they point in opposite directions. So what does it mean for the cross product to be the zero vector? This means the two vectors are parallel to each other. Now, they might be pointing in the same direction or pointing in opposite directions, but they're still um, they're, they're parallel. They're on the same. You could put them onto the same line. Either be pointing in the same direction or pointing in opposite directions. Does that make sense? All right, so what happens we can determine whether two characters are pointing in the same direction by checking to see if the cross product is zero. And we don't have to worry about the actual angles that they're facing in or anything like that, right? We can just, here's a vector that's describing the direction you're looking, and here's a vector that's describing the direction the other character is looking. Let's do the cross product. Is it the zero vector? They're either looking in the same direction or looking in exactly opposite directions, and then we can do a little bit more work to see which direction they're actually you know, is it the same or is it opposite? But it's not, we don't have to calculate a whole bunch of angles or anything like that. So the cross product can tell us the information without us having to do, it tells us trig information without having to do the trigonometry. Right? And so what happens? What kind of calculation is this? This is a straightforward, just multiply some numbers and add, them, add some things together. Um, and if any one of those is not zero, then those two things are not looking in exactly the same direction. Um, if they're all zero, then those two things are pointing either in exactly the same direction or pointing in opposite directions. And then we can do a one more test to see which way is it actually, uh, which way is it actually going. All right. So it turns out that the cross product can be used in ways that that geometric definition doesn't immediately relate to it. Immediately re relates to areas of parallelograms. But areas of parallelograms don't come up that often in, uh, in, in gameplay. But other aspects of things that we can get from the cross product or from the dot product do come up uh, quite often. And so we will use these things a lot. Now, um, if one of these vectors were the zero vector, then the dot product would also be zero. So what does that look like? This, these two things kind of imply that the zero vector is perpendicular to everything. Again, the zero vector actually is the zero vector of the appropriate dimension, right? The zero vector of the appropriate dimension is, a, is perpendicular to all other vectors of that same dimension. And that in 3D, the zero vector is parallel to all the vectors. That's what it looks like this suggests. Well, it turns out that the zero vector doesn't have any direction at all, really, so it's neither perpendicular nor parallel to anything, but it's okay. We just accept that, that it would be this weird special case, right? The zero vector doesn't really have direction, but when we need to think about it and pretend like it does for a moment, uh, we say, okay, well, it's perpendicular to everything and it's parallel to everything. It's just the zero vector. It's special, right? But any other vector, there's no other vector that can be perpendicular and parallel to everything. So if you find out that some vector is perpendicular to something and parallel to it, then, then one of those vectors has to be the zero vector. All right? Um, all right, so what do we have? Now we have the tools uh, to put all of this uh, into, uh, into, our, into our class. There are a couple of other issues that will come up, things that we that we need to um, sometimes deal with. What would happen if we did a mix and match where you have the dot product and the cross product in the same kind of calculation? 
which comes first? Which calculation would we would we need to do first here? Well, let's see. If we did the dot product first, what would we get? What what kind of thing is that? That's a number. Can you do a number cross a vector? No. So we can't do it in that order. What is the only order that makes sense? The only order that makes sense is this order. Right? You can't do the dot product first. The cross product would have to come first. Otherwise, we don't have uh, we, we can't do a number cross something. It has to be a three-dimensional vector cross something. So if we do the cross product first, what happens? Then we have a vector there, a vector there, and the dot product is what kind of thing? This is a number, right? This is a scalar. So sometimes this is called the scalar triple product because we have three pieces and there's some kind of multiplication, but it's a scalar at the end of it. What would happen if we did this? Well, in this case, it turns out that this, in general, is not the same as this. So we'll see that a little bit later. So here, uh, when you have the cross product, you do have to have parentheses that go with it. We have to know which one we're doing first, and then uh, which one, you know, which which product comes later. Um, but we can do this, right? You do get a three-dimensional vector, and then and then your answer is three-dimensional. Same thing on this side; it's three-dimensional. It's just that the thing you get over here and the thing you get over here aren't usually the same. Can they be the same? They can be. But what this means is that in general, they're not the same. Um, all right, so we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, so we'll see some uses for these triple products and some things that we're going to do as well. Right? So whether it's the scalar triple product or the vector triple product, uh, we'll, we'll see some, some things that we'll do with that. Um, what about this? What about that? Does it work? I don't think so. What happens if you do a dot b? You get a number, and you can't dot that with a vector. What about if you did b dot c? And you get a number. So that doesn't mean anything at all, right? So that thing. You don't have that kind of triple product. The only kind of triple product is when you have one of each or both being the cross product. All right, there are some uh, kind of properties of all of these things that we could list. Um, but right now, I'm going to, well, just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to list a bunch of properties, things that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, some other things that we will see and that we will use, just so you can have them all in one place. All right, so this is just some properties of the dot product and the cross product. All right, so no particular order. Um, we said that if you do a dot b, actually, let's even before that, let's just do some property. I guess we could do some general properties of vectors. If you add two vectors together, it doesn't matter the order, right? You can do whichever one first, uh, whichever one second. What happens if you subtract? Subtraction is just adding a vector going in the opposite direction. So we saw that already. 
What happens if you add two vectors by adding those first? You get the same thing as if you had added those first. All right, so this is called the commutative property of addition. This is the associative property of addition. It says you can reassociate, you can put things together uh, how, how you like. What would happen if you had some numbers? So S and T are numbers. If you had S, then times the vector T times A, number and a number, you could put the numbers together, and that's all OK. So you can associate the multiplica multiplication part, kind of separate it out of the vector. All right, so not, not surprising. I mean, we saw that that works. What happens if you have a number and you multiply it by the sum of two vectors? You can distribute. Right, there's a distributive property of the scalar over the vector addition. What would happen if we had a vector and we created k times a? So we had a vector a, multiply it by k, and then calculate the length. The length is going to be the absolute value of k times the length of a. So the scaling just changes the length, right? The k, if it's negative, what does it do? If k is negative, what would happen to k times a? It would change its direction, but it doesn't change its, I mean, the negative changes direction, but the k part changes the length the same way. So the overall length uh, uses the absolute value instead of the, um, instead of just k itself. Um, a few other things that we've seen. What about the length of any vector? The length of any vector is a non-negative number. Again, right? These are all things that we've talked about, uh, just kind of putting, putting them all in one place. What would happen if I had two vectors a and b, and I add the length of a squared and the length of b squared, Well, let's see. Will that be equal to the length of a plus b squared? We want to explore this one, right? So we'll do we'll do some uh, in, in an assignment. We'll do some exploration to see is this equal? Is it always equal? Is it sometimes equal? Is it never equal? Right. So we'll we'll explore that a little bit. What about the length of A plus the length of B itself. How would that compare to the length of A plus B? So if we had A, let's say pointing here, and we had B here, and then here is A plus B. What do we know happens if you have the length of A plus the length of B? From that picture, what can we tell? This length plus this length is what? Greater than or equal to that length. Why is that? This length is a straight line distance. What is this length plus this length? Not getting there in a straight line. So what happens if you don't get there in a straight line? It takes longer, right? You have to go farther. When could they ever be equal? 
Yeah, if they if they if they both are parallel to each other, right? So if you had A and then B just kept going in the same direction, then the length of A plus B would be equal to the length of A plus the length of B. But otherwise, what happens? This is bigger. So this is called the triangle inequality. And the triangle inequality just says that if you are looking at any triangle, the length of two of the sides have to be greater than the length of the third side. Okay, so if we draw a triangle, what kind of triangle is that? Is that a triangle, first of all? How many of you say yes, it's a triangle? How many of you are afraid to say that it's a triangle at this point? All right, what happens? If we really look at this, this side has length 4. Can these two sides touch? What really happens? A length 1 is something like that, and length 2 is, well, Maybe length one is something like that, and length two is like that. What do we actually have a triangle? No. no, those those other two sides don't actually reach if we even if we folded them down flat. So is this a triangle? No, it's not a triangle. Looks like a triangle, but what is it? A very poorly drawn picture. Right? Because those two sides aren't really that long. They don't touch out here. So that's another issue that we have to be careful of. If we're thinking of something and we draw a picture of it, we need to make sure that the picture actually is possible, actually represents what we meant for it to represent. Otherwise, we can do a bunch of work on something and it not be correct at all, because it turns out that from the beginning, this was not even a triangle. Looks like it. Be hard to convince someone just by looking at that, well, yeah, it's a triangle, because what do we do? We look at the picture and ignore the numbers, right? But the numbers tell us you can't have that. That's not really what's happening. These pieces aren't touching. And so, again, the triangle inequality works in vectors. And it's, this is true even in higher dimensions where we can't imagine what a picture might look like. Uh, but this, this portion is the same. Again, all of these lengths are corresponding to the... Euclidean distance or the two norm, but even with other norms, it still these things still hold. But we don't we're not going to worry about that for for our purposes. Um, all right, so let's see what other kinds of things can we do. We can look at what happens. Um, then so these were all just the vectors without looking at dot or cross product. So let's look at the cross product issues. Similar kind of idea. We said a few minutes ago, and we said last time that. The order of that doesn't matter. So we have a commutative property for the, um, for the dot product. We said that a vector dot itself, if you do the dot product of a vector in itself, what do you get? Yeah, the length of the vector squared which we could then say otherwise if we said, well, what is the length of the vector? The length of the vector is the square root of the dot product with itself, right? The vector dot itself. All right, so th those two mean the same thing, uh, just written in different ways. Often we'll use this. Uh, again, we've talked about using this. Uh, so that we can avoid the square root. There are certain times when we're going to be able to do that, and we'll, we'll focus on that a little bit later. What would happen if we multiplied a number times the dot product? Can we distribute that? Well, what we can do, and we saw this with the algebra, is we can put it on one of them, or attach that number 
to the other one. Okay. So that number just shows up one time, but it scales. And we saw this in one of the examples of um, if you had a, a side that was a unit and then you made it longer, what happens? You just multiply by the length of the side. Doesn't the dot product of A and B just make another number? Yeah, this makes a number. So could you just do, just find that number and then do the case? Well, so yeah, so you can do that. Uh, find this number and then multiply it by k. But there are times when we want to adjust a vector first. You want to change the length of the vector. And if you change the length of the vector, then you get the same answer, no matter if you change the length of the first vector or the length of the second vector, or don't change the length of either vector, do the dot product, and then multiply by k. The, the main thing is that it's not like this, where you now have k times a and a k times b. You just still have one value of k floating around. And you can remember that because th this is a number and that's a number, and when you multiply, you don't create new, new numbers. Right? So you don't create a new value of k uh, in, in that process. Um, what would happen if we mixed dot product and addition? Well, so in this way, we would do the addition first and then the dot product. But what is there a distributive rule here? Can we can we do the dot product of that and the dot product of that like we would with multiplication? What do you think? I mean, if these were just numbers multiplied, you'd do this. You could distribute if you wanted to. This times that plus this times the other thing. What do you think? Well, let's see here. Let's just do this in a two-dimensional case. Um, well, let's just do it in the generic two-dimensional case. So here's A, B, and C. Right, they have an x and a y component each. So what is the left-hand side? a dot b plus c. a dot b plus c is going to be this value times these two added. ax times bx plus cx. Is that okay? And what will the y component be? Same thing, but with the y's. Does that make sense? Because what is the adding these two? You just add the components, and the dot product says multiply this one by that component. So that's what happens on the left-hand side of this. Well, what happens on the right-hand side of this? a dot b plus a dot c is ax times bx plus ax times cx. So we do this dot product and then that dot product and add them together. And the other part down here looks like that. And the question then is, are these two the same? And they are, right? Because you distribute the a. These are just numbers, so you distribute the a there, you distribute the a y there, and these and these numbers and these numbers match up exactly, and so we can distribute in that way. Make sense? What if we swapped the order and did a plus b then dot c? Yeah, it all it changes the order of things around. It all still works out, right? Um, everything everything is fine. All right, so uh, we we can do that. And what do we do sometimes is we will think of a calculation in one way or think of it in the other way, and it's the same answer, right? It's okay. We can um, depending on how we're solving a particular problem and the way we 
think of the problem. One person may do it this way and one person may do it this way because you're thinking in a, uh, you know, of the geometry in a slightly different way. The answers all turn out to be exactly the same at the end. Uh, all right, so we talked already about what the dot product being zero means. It means that the two vectors are perpendicular. Uh, the cross product being zero means the two vectors are parallel. parallel. Uh, we said that with the cross product is not symmetric, or excuse me, not commutative. It's anti-commutative. So if you change the order, you have to change the direction as well. Um, what if you change the direction of both pieces? Compare this to this. What do you think happens? Yeah, you get exactly the same answer. Right? If you flip both of them, then the resulting vector is the same, is the same answer in both cases. Uh, what would happen if we multiplied a number before the cross product? We're multiplying a number before the cross product. Let's come, well, let's go the other way. Let's come way back to the beginning. Where was it? Oh. If you multiply a number by one of these, what's that going to do? That number could be associated with either of them. All right, and so what will happen in the, uh, in the cross product? We could associate the number with this vector and then cross that, or we could associate it with that vector and cross like that. All right, so, uh, so again, not a surprise probably, uh, but some things are a bit surprising. What happens if we do a cross product times the sum? Well, after we have our cross product method in place, we can check to see, is this going to be equal We could do it by hand now, or with some examples, um, or even in, in the generic case, right? Ax, bx, or ax, ay, az. Um, but we will check this later on uh, once we have our methods in place to see does this work out? What do you think? Just a guess. Do you think it works, or do you think it doesn't work? It's hard to, hard to say, right? We don't have enough experience with it yet. Um, so what's going to happen if you have A? Well, it's harder to draw in, in, in the board, on the board right now. Um, we'll just wait until we have our method and we can test it and, and see with some examples. And then if we find some examples where they're not the same, what do we know? We know that they're not usually the same. If all of our examples are the same, what does that tell us? Uh, just tells us that our examples were all the same, right? Then we'll look at it in a little more detail at that point. But we can use the tool to test to see, can I find some where these two answers are different? And if I can find some where these two answers are different, then we can't trust what's happening. Um, and we already said that this isn't usually the same as that, but you don't believe me. So again, when we have our tools in place, then we will do some tests and see uh, that they're not usually the same. But you don't believe me right now. It's like, you don't, have a, you don't really have an opinion right now. I told you something, you're like, okay, yeah, whatever. Uh, but we'll see this and we'll check that situation uh, and then look into it a little bit more fully. All right, so what do we have? Um, we have a lot of tools that we need to build, and then we're going to start to use those tools so we can see why we've gone through all this effort, right? Why have we spent two hours this morning uh, looking at, well, I guess hour and 20 minutes this morning, looking at all of these other things? What's the benefit of all of that, right? So we will start to use these tools and see what we can actually get out of them.
All right, so um, as usual, as you're working on things, if you have any questions, Discord, email, um, ask questions. All right.